Hello, and welcome to the Developer Spotlight, where smart growth founder and real estate entrepreneur Chris Porto interviews top real estate developers from around the world. Chris explores their philosophies, their success mindsets, their career paths, and how their work is contributing to a sustainable future. And most importantly, how you and I, the next generation of real estate developers, can start building wealth in this business right now. In this episode with Kevin Cavanaugh of Guerrilla Development out of Portland, Oregon, we talk about a whole spectrum of topics that people are going to really enjoy. Kevin is a, a lifestyle developer, as I would categorize it in the truest of senses. He is doing some hyper creative projects up in Portland, ranging primarily in the office retail space, but also emerging into residential development and all the way to something fascinating that I learned, which was more uh, his effort to address homelessness. So the amount of creativity that Kevin is bringing to the table is something very enviable, and he's really paving the way for a new type of developer to emerge in this next generation that I actually feel uh, very much an affinity for, which is those smaller scale developers that are looking to make local impact in their urban environment and build wealth doing it but not at the expense of their own personal freedom and expression. And that's something that I think everybody, as they hear Kevin and visit his website to see the projects that he is taking on, will really get in a real way. So I I hope you enjoy the interview that I know I did. Welcome, everybody, back to the Smart Growth Developer Spotlight. Uh, My guest today is Kevin Cavanaugh of Gorilla Development out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, I just met him uh, not too long ago uh, on a uh, Urban Land Institute experience trip up to Portland to see what was happening. And Kevin was uh, a developer that stood out uh, to me as someone really uh, walking the talk uh, in a very authentic way. And uh, I knew that I had to interview him for this podcast sooner than later. So I'm very gracious to have him uh, with me here. I'm going to throw it over to Kevin, and uh, he'll give us a little self-introduction. Kevin, uh, over to you. How's it going, Chris? Thanks for, thanks for calling. Thanks for kind of scraping the, 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 the bottom of the, of the low-tech barrel and, and <laughs> calling me on my landline. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, trained as an architect, went to... Uh, school at, at Cal, got my degree there. Um, bought a house in Sacramento because I couldn't afford a house in the Bay Area, and I wanted to, you know, understand architecture from like ripping the walls out and and the construction side of it. I also wanted to understand the math behind the the development side mm-hmm. of owning a house and what that looked like. So I started small and knew I always wanted to be a, a developer eventually. Um, uh, a couple of years in the Peace Corps in Africa, building more. Uh, homes and how and, and schools, and then right at, right when I got back, I just as a 25 year old moved to Portland sight unseen, which is kind of funny because there's still tons of people, even from your neck of the woods and from the Midwest and from mm-hmm. New York, moving to Portland sight unseen mm. um, for tons of reasons. I mean that's its own podcast episode, but uh, <laughs> and now 22 years after moving here, I'm uh, I wake up every day and I can't wait to get to work and and do more projects that's so awesome it's pretty damn fun yeah i mean so uh i'd love to dive into your story a little bit more uh in depth uh because uh your trajectory right so you you said you were trained as an architect which Mm -hmm. surely helps from a uh from the perspective of getting into development because you get to see more of the design process right but were you envious at the time of you know when you were in an architect's role of uh, of seeing other people doing projects, and did you have that aspiration uh, to do your own from the very get go? Well, yeah, I mean, envy, yeah, um, loathing. Yeah, there's lots of <laughs> words that you could use in there. It's I hated being uh, at the the at the big table, but I had a kid chair. Yeah, you know, architects are we're it's a service industry, and yeah. we have a we have clients, and and we draw what you ask us to draw or tell mm-hmm. us to draw. And we might have some really compelling ideas, 
but either I'm selling you deeply on my ideas, and if I don't understand the math behind your that's working in your brain, mm-hmm. um, and usually I don't, those ideas never get traction, and I get minimized, and then I'm left at best arguing, for love of God, please can we at least not put vinyl, shitty vinyl windows in this building? Mm-hmm. So it's a pretty passive um, and uh, impotent role. Mm-hmm. In, in, as in, in, the built, in the built environment, we, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, uh, designers, architects had a much more prominent seat at the table, and now we just don't. And I realized that even getting into college, that that the person sitting across the table from me, the client, mm-hmm. they weren't smarter than me. Um, they just, they just <laughs> were sitting in a chair. I wanted to sit in, and I, I oftentimes talk about phase zero. Mm. So architects get hired at phase one, mm-hmm. and we never get invited to design phase zero. Um, phase zero is here's a piece of land. I'll buy this piece of land, and, and what am I going to put on it? Right. That's so you basically have that's, a you have a given input basically from, from somebody else's efforts. Yeah, well, it's just like in design school. It's like, cool, here's a site. We're going to put a library on it, and the library has to be this big. Yeah. No one, your professor never asks you in design school, should we put a library on it, or what should we, what else should we put on it, mm-hmm. or why does the library have to be that big? Mm-hmm. Or like Rem Coolhouse in Seattle, Seattle let him reinvent the library and didn't tell him it has to be X square feet, it mm-hmm. has to be, you know, these kinds of books have to be housed in this kind of way, and he completely reinvented the library because he got to own phase zero. Right. And architects and, never and, get to do that. And I, and I can see how that is uh, the thing that could limit creativity, right? So totally. what, what, yeah. what's, what's so obvious to me in, in all of your projects, and people can see your website and see, uh, I was lucky enough to actually go and get a tour of it firsthand, and it's bursting with creativity. Oh, thanks. So there, there is something that you're saying here where in, in that role where you're kind of given certain inputs, you have to kind of fit within somebody else's box. Yeah, Where, whereas yeah. you're kind of bursting out of your own box, which I love, I love to see, especially in the developer role, because it is a very powerful role. So well, how, funny. how are you I doing this? Go ahead. Sorry. No, just, I'm just curious. How are you, how are you doing this? What are, what are you consciously doing to kind of uh, come out of, uh, of the box in a very creative way? Oh, that's it. I mean, any one of your listeners, well, what, who is your audience typically? Are they architects? Are they developers? Everybody. Who's so here? architects, okay. engineers, development professionals, uh, real estate investors, maybe on the residential side that are that yeah. looking to get into commercial development uh, and, yeah. and so on. So anyone that has anything of a right brain, um, any creative sort, um, we tend to, when we're hired at phase one, we've got to stay, we're coloring something, but we've got to stay in the lines. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have to stay in the lines. I don't have a client. I don't have a boss. I could do whatever the hell I want. Um, but uh, if I'm going to be successful, I've got to toggle. And I can't stay in my right brain. I've got to move over to my left brain and make sure the numbers work. Yes. So a lot of what I do, and I talk to my coworkers about it and, and, and the crew here at Gorilla, is especially in near 2017 and, and certainly going into next year, is um, redefine the word enough. Mm. So if if I'm a traditional real estate developer and I'm going to paint a caricature, kind of a monochromatic caricature of you know some dude wearing a mon- monocle, you know, a 65 <laughs> year old overweight white guy wearing a monocle, yeah. and and if I'm a real estate developer, um, it's no it's no surprise that the the stock evil characters in, in movies tend to be developers and the stock good guys tend to be architects. Um, and there's <laughs> Just a very thin line separating the two, yeah. but I, I love straddling that line, which is kind of fun. So mm. if I'm if I'm wearing a monocle, um, I'm I'm living in my left brain, mm-hmm. and every single move I monetize, and I try to figure out how I can squeeze more and more and more and more and more profit out of a project. Mm-hmm. We don't do that at Guerrilla Development. That's not that's not in any way part of what we do. We, we, when we work in our left brain, which is, you know, half the time, we toggle back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. We make sure that our ideas have merit. Our ideas have some kind of strong financial foundation mm-hmm. that, that is a long-term hold. We're making good money. We're making enough money. So we, we, we love redefining the word enough right now. So what is a 
you know, I, I, a 20, the zipper, you walk through the zipper with me. Yes. The zipper's, I think, offensively profitable. It makes 23% per year over a 10 year life span. And maybe you can give a, a brief just synopsis of, of what the, uh, the zipper, your, one of your projects uh, is in its essence. Oh, sure. So the zipper is a seven unit, uh, all pure commercial, single story wood frame building, new construction on a little leftover triangle piece of land on Sandy Boulevard. Sandy Boulevard, what city are you in, Chris? I'm in Oakland. Okay, in Oakland. So what's the, so maybe it would be like East 12th Avenue, Mm -hmm. you know, so wherever like all the used car lots were in the 70s and 80s, every city has that. So Sandy Boulevard in Portland is that street and it's pretty gross. There's nothing that compelling to it. But I got a little triangular piece of land rather inexpensively. I think it's like a 10,000 square foot piece of land. And I put a single story piece of new construction on it. It was the old used uh, Cadillac, Vic Alfonso used Cadillac parking lot. So I bought it for $600,000 and I built um, a building really inexpensively. Mm -hmm. And it was my second micro restaurant project. So four of the seven units are micro restaurants. So there's a ton of food carts here in Portland, 600 or so, Mm -hmm. and there's a ton of restaurants, but there's nothing in between. Mm -hmm. So I, I, a food cart costs twenty five thousand dollars. I I did the ocean, my first micro res- restaurant project, and my tenants were spending about fifty to sixty thousand dollars for their build out. So they okay. sell so their good, cart. Good step up. What's that? That's a good step up. Totally. So instead of spending a quarter billion dollars on a restaurant build out space, that that would be overwhelming and daunting to an individual. Mm-hmm. They would need, and that's why you see change. That's why you see deep pocketed folk going in, but oftentimes the sous chef at the, at a great restaurant is supremely talented, but never gets a chance to hang their shingle. So Portland mm-hmm. has a low bar of entry in the entrepreneurial world. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to capture that talent. And the only thing getting in the way of that talent um, being in my buildings was money. And the only thing that, that, that was defining the money was the size of the space. So mm-hmm. if I hand you keys to a 550 square foot micro restaurant, mm-hmm. And I put in the toilets and I put in the common dining room and I put in the outdoor, outdoor, outdoor patio with fire pits and, and I make the building look pretty damn fetching from mm-hmm. the car passing by. You're probably going to succeed and you're going to spend 60 grand, not $250,000. You can probably get that money with the SBA loan and or borrow money from family or friends. Right. And you can hang your shingle and you can open up. And then I can choose between just the, the most talent I can find and I could just choose the most amazing badass menus and I can pick menus that really work well with each other. So when you and I go there, we go there with a dozen friends, there's a full bar mm-hmm. and four micro restaurants and there's a coffee shop and there's a nail salon called finger bang. Yeah. And <laughs> which of course I have to put in there. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and, and 600 people a day go to the zipper. Wow. And it's super, it's super successful and I'm really happy about it. And one of my tenants didn't make it and she sold and she had, you know, multiple offers from people to buy her lease and buy her built out restaurant. And then the new woman that came in is just absolutely crushing it. Yeah. And, um, and most of my tenants are now looking for second and third spaces and it's a great success story. But the funny thing is the site was zoned to go up six stories with uh, ground floor retail and housing above. Wow. So I get pushed back for two. Re- I get pushed back from developers mm-hmm. who say, "Hey, Kevin, you're leaving money on the table. Yeah, you know, you're, that's not highest and best use." Right. And I think you heard me. That's not enough. That's not enough. Kevin. Yeah, that's not enough. And I laugh and I'm like, "Well, Ted, since when is 23 percent per year not enough?" Right. A comparable. B. I've run the numbers on a six story building, and it's not better than 23 mm. percent. Um, C. You're talking about highest use, but not highest and best use. I think we've kind of forgotten about the word best and not every site needs to be a hundred percent maxed out extruded lot line Hulk. That's not what pay- we, we go to vacation in Amsterdam and Paris and yeah. San Francisco and, and we are, are, are really attracted to neighborhoods that have three to five story buildings in them and yep. that, that are 30 feet wide. And it's a good we go there for density. vacation yet we're, yeah, yet we're okay living in cities that have these kind of monolithic, hulking pieces of shit. That, <laughs> that, or, or we actually give the developers a pass because, you know, development is just kind of what happens to us. We have no say in it. Mm. 
Well, I mean, so I mean there's there's so many good points that you're that you're bringing up in this. I mean, because what you're doing is you're you are creating places. You're you're creating vibrant places. That was my experience going to the zipper, and you know you're doing it for the fraction of the cost. So yeah, yeah. you know it, it, you really do seem to be focused more on the experience that people get from being in that space, uh, which arguably touches people deeper than you know building as high as you can go. Well, and the funny thing is, so, so developers argue that I'm not building big. And then the funny thing is, I'll get arguments from architects saying, well, you're not building dense. That's actually kind of, um, mm-hmm. that's a kind of a suburban model because you're building a one story, you know, a better version of a strip mall. Mm-hmm. And then I, I laugh at that idea that density has to be based on square footage. Because hmm. as I mentioned earlier, 600 people a day go to the 8,000 square foot building. Right. And, and, and it's about neighborhood activization. And yes. right across the street in two of the four directions, as we speak, they're building six story apartment buildings. Like, mm. that's fine. Let them do that. But, yeah. but it's this kind of concept of, of a formula. Like, somehow there's a formula that has to work and there's only one recipe and only one answer. Mm. I don't want to live in that city. For sure. No, and you're, and you're creating differences and, and, um, and blank spaces where pe- people can actually gravitate towards in order to, to connect with one another. And yeah, as yeah. you said, all of the housing around you can come to that place. So I, I totally agree that it, it, there is a bit of a misnomer when it comes to density. So can you yeah. elaborate a little bit more on, on what your vision is for the right type of density in a city to create a um, sense of uh, vibrancy? I actually can't because it's all site specific yeah. and it's all, it happens to, to, to do with like, like right now there is a housing emergency in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, and so, so a lot of what I see. Yeah. So, so if I get to a site uh, three years ago, I probably have a different answer than I would today. Mm-hmm. So it, it's, it, it's always different. One other final thought on the zipper before mm-hmm. we close the book on that sure. one though, is I love when you own phase zero and you get to decide that it's a single story building with a bunch of micro restaurants, by the way, I'm getting the most rent per square foot, um, in the area yeah. because my, because it's the, the space is tiny and the infrastructure is solid mm-hmm. and my tenants don't care about price per square foot. My mm-hmm. tenants just say to me, you know, what's rent? And I say, okay, cool. It's 2000 bucks a month or it's 2,500 bucks a month, right. which it's is a, different a shitload metric. per square foot. Yeah. yeah. They're like, cool. I can make that on a Saturday. On yeah. a good Saturday, I can make rent. That works for my model. Yeah. So they don't, they don't think in those other terms. So other developers will look at this and say, cool, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do it at scale. Yeah. Then I just think, well, okay, but it just doesn't translate at scale, but you can try if you want, but that's about you being greedy again. It's not about you. Um, and, and, and the last comment on the zipper is the lenticular art, which I think is fascinating. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, this is definitely a story not made for radio, but, um, <laughs> but the entire exterior of the building is covered with 417 vertical piece slats of wood that I brought in. Um, artists, street artists from one from LA, one from Portland, one from Tokyo, mm. and each of them painted one of the three sides of the of the building. And from different directions as you drive by, it creates you know kind of like art at thirty five miles an hour. Totally. And it costs thirty five grand to do it, and it doesn't give me a penny more rent. So a, a traditional developer would say, well, why the hell would you even consider that? And and it's so fun being at able to design phase zero and not have a client and not have to justify that or sell the idea. You just do it. Yeah. And it, you know, maybe I'd make 24% per year. If I didn't do that or 23 and a half, I don't care. Yeah. It's, it, it, it defines the building. And now there are so many other tenants that want to go into my future buildings because of that, mm. that it's the long game. And oftentimes people don't, don't, we forget to play the long game. Right. And they're, they're also the intangibles too. So you're, you're kind of really highlighting the point that incorporating art into your developments or open space, right? You might not be able to monetize that with any sort of cash flow stream, but it does add to the experience of the participants in that yep. that structure. So yeah, I, I, the exterior paint job of the Fairhair Dumbbell is a half a million dollars. I have no idea if that makes sense or not, but it doesn't not make sense. So I'm doing it. Well, and let's shift to that one because that that was uh, I only had a chance to drive by it. I had to stop my Uber in order to get out and actually uh, <laughs> see what they were doing. And I caught the the artist actually uh, mid process uh, as he was yeah. p- painting the building. Which I mean, this building is like a you know a loud sort of uh, beautiful artistic creation. And I, I I love how you basically just went white stucco 
and yeah. basically provided a canvas for an artist. So uh, maybe you yeah. can give us a, a kind of paint the picture for what the Fair Hero Dumbbell is and, and why you believe it's significant in, uh, in Portland's development. Hi, everybody. It's Chris Porto here. I just want to take a minute during this interview to interject and share with you a little bit about a new and exciting program that I've just recently launched called the Developer Academy. The Smart Growth Developer Academy is designed to provide anybody who is interested in stepping into the role of developer or scaling up their business in real estate already to get involved in this particular type of development that I and uh, many other people are promoting in this movement towards smart growth. So I want to uh, invite you to check out my website at smartgrowth.co. And uh, if you check on the services section and you'll see the Developer Academy on there, it's an eight-week program. Uh, You'll basically get taken through step-by-step all the processes that I go through each and every time to develop real estate in my local market with a triple bottom line result, financial social and environmental. I really believe in what's happening in this program. I already have about 20 students going through the the first iteration, the first cohort of this program, and know that everyone is getting a lot out of it. I'm also providing a lot of resources to my students, uh, including the financial models, the marketing campaigns, and the legal contracts necessary to actually start making money in this business by creating impact, most importantly. So thanks so much for listening. I will go right back to the episode, but I, I just wanted to share with you and let you know that there is a way to continue your engagement and interest here and, and really dive in as a developer. So just to remind you, the URL is http colon slash slash smartgrowth.co. Check out the website. You can see what else we're doing uh, beyond the Developer Academy. But I highly recommend you checking out and seeing if the program is right for you. I mean, this building is like a you know a loud sort of uh, beautiful artistic creation, and I, I I love how you basically just went white stucco and yeah. basically provided a canvas for an artist. So uh, maybe you can yeah. give us a. a kind of paint the picture for what the Fair Hero Dumbbell is and, and why you believe it's significant in, uh, in Portland's development? Oh, I don't know if it's, that's, that's for you to decide if it's significant, but I can tell you what it is. Um, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's, I was awarded the site. There was a competition the city had for, for five prominent sites at kind of the nexus of Portland, mm. um, uh, at, at MLK Boulevard and Burnside Street. And I was one of the, uh, people awarded a site based on an idea that wasn't the dumbbell. I, my idea was a tall, skinny housing tower, and my idea was also to crowdfund it mm. to be the first new construction that that took advantage of the Jobs Act and you know, went through the SEC to get mm. blessed to, to to crowdfund a piece of real estate. So um, that the latter part of that equation, the crowdfunding, was fascinating. It added two years of process and a couple, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of legal fees. And I raised $1.5 million from everyday people in as small as $3,000 chunks. <laughs> Super interesting. Took such a long time that by the time I was done, uh, my housing tower looked like programmatically like all the buildings that were coming up around me. Mm. And so then as a contrarian, I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. Uh, <laughs> it, this, this is, it's just too much of the same, and that doesn't make a village. I mean, Portland's great because it's a city stitched together by villages. And a village has, you know, hardware stores and movie theaters and bookstores and restaurants and a ton of housing options. So this was kind of becoming a monochromatic, at least programmatically, a monochromatic intersection. Yeah. I don't want that. So I then said, well, I'll do a sh- instead of a tall, skinny housing tower, I'll do a short squat office building. <laughs> so... Then I, and I don't, this site is weird. It's, it's like a, it's surrounded by a moat of streets. It's only a 13,000 square foot site and it has no back to it. Mm. So the building is going to be expensive because you can't like bury blank walls anywhere. Right. And, and then I went to, um, it's okay. It's going to be an office building. This is, by the way, kind of a long story. So I apologize. In no, not, not at all. Uh, I, mean, I think this is an important thing to tell. Um, your listeners are going to get tired of hearing me talk after, <laughs> after a while. That's fine. Um, Au contraire. So, 
And by the way, if they ever are important, they shouldn't visit me because I got not, beyond what I'm telling you, I got nothing. This is I'm kind of a one-trick pony. <laughs> um, so now that I'm doing an office building, I would reach out to friends in the like the commercial real estate brokerage community and say, what what kind of office tenants are aren't being met by the market right now? Yep. Oh, you know, small to medium-sized creative office users. I'm like, cool. That's the I I would like those for tenants. Yeah. <laughs> those are the, that those are good fits for me. Yeah, those could be you friends too. That in, yeah. So then what does that mean? They're like, well, 12 to 15 people or 12 to maybe 25 people. I'm like, okay, cool. What does that mean square footage wise? Mm. 4,000 square feet. Mm. Like, okay, cool. I will build a 4,000 square foot box. And so each tenant gets a floor. Yeah. And then I'll see how many 4,000 square foot boxes I can fit onto the site. I tried to fit three and it took, got some weird curve to the site, so I couldn't do it. So mm. I ended up doing two 4,000 square foot boxes, 65 mm-hmm. feet by 65 feet. And then I connected them with sky, a sky bridge. Mm. And, um, and that's kind of the dumbbell shape. And so that's kind of where I got the massing of it. Just, again, that's, that's purely data that comes from, uh, you know, my, my left brain. That is, that is like a developer diving into it to do a smart building. Yeah, exactly. Of, well, and, and, yeah. You're, and you're also relying on market data from experienced professionals. So, you know, your contrarian yeah. model, I think, works really well because you're looking for the unmet demand that yeah. you could be right around all the new construction. And if you provide something that's different, it's a completely different market at the end of the day. Exactly. And I'm not trying to tilt into windmills here. I mean, I, I, I make reference to doing that all the time, but really it, it's, if I don't do my homework, shame on me. Yeah. So I could be a contrarian, but then I'm going to back, back that up with the deep data. Right. So I have the data. I know what this building kind of looks like. It's a dumbbell shaped building with a couple of 4,000 square foot footprint, um, six story buildings, five over one. Um, and, uh, and then I go about the crowdfunding and then I go about designing it and, it was just pure randomness the way it looks the way it looks. So I, I <laughs> asked my the you know, one of my coworkers to go out and who who makes my models for me? I asked Anna to go to the, the uh, all of our models are just like white or beige museum board. <laughs> and I asked her to go out and go buy some gift wrap from like a really fancy um paper store in the uh-huh. neighborhood. And she brought back a bunch of different options. We chose these two different Florentine gift wrap patterns. And so she glued them onto the museum board and then she laser cut it and built the model and came back a week later. And it was, uh, I was like, holy crap. We both realized it right away. We're like, we have to, literally, we have to build exactly that. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I saw the model actually in your model, in your office there. And uh, yeah. it came out actually pretty similar to what you guys have done to even the mural. Well, yeah, it's, which is fun. So I went and I, I found who who owned the the newspaper that that sorry the gift wrap paper it's mr rossi in florence italy i reached out to him i bought the copyright to the paper (laughs) i was literally (laughs) gonna do it like just exactly um that pattern i went to the city was uh, was in for design review and they said i couldn't and at first i fought them and they ultimately were right because we have very strict billboard laws here and copyrighted material can't go in a building. You know, I, could, I can't put the Nike swoosh on a building. Sure. It's not okay. So it had to be original art. And then I, I was part of a selection committee that went around and identified 60 international artists. Um, and we got down to four finalists with the intent of doing something that fit the same adjectives as, a, as that gift wrap paper. Mm-hmm. You know, whimsical, colorful, vibrant, dynamic, um, crazy. Uh, does that descri- does that describe your your personality? Would you say too? No, I doubt it. You can ask <laughs> my wife. I don't think so. Um, um, no, I mean Portland is a is a gray city with gray streets and gray skies, yeah. and our buildings are kind of safe, mm. which is surprising because culturally we're not a safe city. We're we're kind of out there and we're fun and we're we're like the Portland that that more describes Portland. You know, vibrant and colorful and whimsical and yeah. Portland weird. We, we, you know, there, there's a phrase called keep Portland safe or keep, keep Portland gray. Yeah. Right. Um, keep Portland mocha and sage green and beige. <laughs> it's not a bumper sticker. So the five, the four finalists were from Portland, Oakland, Los Angeles, and Buenos Aires. <laughs> we flew them in the Portland, gave them blank white models, toured the site and said, you know, come back in two months with your idea. <laughs> and these were all really compelling artists in their own right. Um, 
And they came back in two months, and we kind of debated it, and and we ended up with James Jean. It was almost a unanimous decision. And he's a Taiwanese uh, artist based in L.A. right now. And it, we've been spending the last five and a half months. The crew that you saw mm-hmm. is a, um, a crew of professional building painters. There's five or six crews like that in the world. One of them happens to be Portland-based. Dan Cohen is his name, and he has his crew. That's convenient. And he spent five and a half months painting yeah. the dumbbell exactly um, uh, true to James Jean's original piece that he did for the building. And it's hard to, you just have to kind of look it up because any of your listeners might not have been like, yeah, that sounds cool, but you just have to look it up. And there's a backstory behind what each line means and it looks like it's abstract, but there's actually, there are actually objects, but you don't know they're objects. And anyway, it's it's super impressive because I mean, there's, there's so much depth actually being brought into your process, your development process that, you know, it's, you can see that the care that you're taking with, the projects that you take on. And I think many developers, as, as we've been kind of alluding to, see more is better, right? More more projects, just churn them out. And they probably don't focus more on, you know, the moment and, and, and that project and making that project the best that it can possibly be and how it can make a statement for the world because they're already kind of looking ahead to what's, what's next after this one. Yeah. No, it's true. More is not better. More is just more. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> And it, could be more, it could be more stress too. So yeah. I, I, and you know, just one more point on the, on the dumbbell, I, I toured the building next to it, which has mm-hmm. a co-working space in it. Right. Oh, so yeah. like just, you know, uh, logically it makes a lot of sense for once those companies start to graduate out of there, they would naturally want to probably move up in the world in terms of space over to, to your project too. So was that also in yep. your awareness? Well, I wasn't thinking about that, but that's what's happening. So the funny thing is people will give me credit for stuff that I don't deserve credit for like that. <laughs> like I, I, I'm not prescient in that way, but the first three leases I signed at the, at the for office space in the dumbbell did indeed come from across the street, nice. which is awesome. But yeah, I get no credit for that. So uh, let's talk more about being a small scale developer because, mm-hmm. you know, most of the time as I've experienced in my own development here in Oakland, you know, everything is self-funded. So it does create limitations um, yeah. and, you know, having to go out to outside investors is, you know, a, a natural challenge. Do you, um, do you feel like going out to outside investors and bringing them into the process dilutes your ability to be authentic in, you know, uh, doing a project as if you were the sole financier of the project? Uh, that's a great question. Because uh, the neat thing is, oh, sorry, another call is coming in. Um, again, low tech. Uh, the neat thing is, I had the, the beginning of my career as a developer was just me, no investors, no outside money, um, and a lot of smoke and mirrors and pre-recession loans that it, that relied on a lot of leverage yep. um, that I couldn't get today, and. Then the recession came around and it completely wiped me out. Mm. My, you know, my wife is a hospice nurse. She works part time. Uh, I did my first two developments while still working at Fletcher Far Ayat, an architecture firm downtown, making eighteen bucks an hour, no benefits. So it really was smoke and mirrors. And I did the box in one project. And I did the Ode to Roses building, and those were my first two developments. And I owned them uh, on my own. And then I did the Burnside Rocket Building, which is lead platinum. Really proud of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, no investors. I own 100% of it. But at the end of the day, all it takes is one bad bank, or we, we all we all are having a great time uh, in days like today, when the salad days, when just money is easy and we're cruising. Yeah. The question is, what does it look like when it goes sideways, and right. what? Partners are going to act well, nice. Who's going to be kind? Who's going to take their kid gloves, gloves off and, and be a bare knuckle boxer? And I had one bank, Pacific Continental Bank, up here, and they were the bank, uh, the lender on the the rocket, and they were uh, almost just uh, uh, sadistic with the way they treated me. And it took me out, and it forced this domino effect where I had to sell all all. But by the time it was done. And I stood up and I was dusting myself off. Hmm. I was a million dollars underwater. Wow. So that's that's the negative of having sole control, sole ownership, 
and no investors. Yeah, I have you, ha- no you have horsepower. the sole risk. Sole risk, and I have no capacity or horsepower to um, to, to ride that out. Mm. And the funny thing is, side note, I don't blame anyone for the, the wealth disparity in America today mm-hmm. because everyone who bought my three, my three buildings that I sold – Rich Californians own them right now, and they're smart. They're opportunistic. I was selling willingly. I had to sell, so they bought low. I sold low, so shame on me. So post-recession, so you know, I pick myself up. I'm 40-whatever years old, 42 years old, a million dollars underwater. And like I would tell my friends or coworkers or anyone who would listen, it's not like I was a genius on Tuesday and an idiot on Wednesday. I was never <laughs> that smart and I'm, I'm, I was never that stupid, but I still know how to make, knew how to make buildings. So I had to figure out how to do it in the new economy. And that meant getting investors. And I, like you were kind of alluding to, I was worried that investors meant a diluted phase zero, a diluted mm. product. Mm. And I, sh- I didn't need to be worried about that because it's my project and they could either say yes or no, but they can't say yes, but paint it a different color or yes, but could you put these windows in instead or yes, but don't put the lenticular art in the zipper. Mm. They get paid first. I get paid last. Mm -hmm. So, and they trust me and they have to trust me and I'm not willing to do it otherwise. Um, And it, and it's great. It, It is the most frustrating part of what I do is finding Enlightened capital is what I call it. Sure. And finding rich people who want to give me, you know, quarter million dollars, half million dollars. And full control, and, it sounds like. Right? Exactly. That, that's kind of yeah, what, you, that's have, what you're highlighting, right? Yeah. So, so you are – if you give me a half million dollars tomorrow, you, you have to shut the hell up and sit in the passenger seat. Hmm. And you get paid first and you get prioritized over everything else. Yep. And I treat you really, really, really well. But you have no say in tenants – you know, uh, uh, aesthetics, design issues, anything. Um, but your check comes religiously yep. and it never stops nice. and it only grows with time. You know, you, you get an 8% preferred dividend, uh, and you get paid quarterly and it never goes below that. How and about, how about the major capital events? Like who gets to, who gets to decide who sells? Do you, do you give that control back to the investors, even though it's your baby? So that's actually really important. Um, I need patient capital, and, and over the last, I don't know, four, maybe five years, any building that's getting put up in town, it's assumed it's going to sell the, the, the second the final coat of paint is dry. And I don't ever do that. I view these as really boring long-term annuities. And, you know, the, the zipper is a good example, or even the, the ocean. The ocean is five years old. It's my first post-recession project, so more like six years old, and it's a pretty boring little adaptive reuse. Again, more micro restaurants. It's super lucrative. It, the investors, there's three investors. They didn't put in a whole lot of money that wasn't much needed, and they have a 8% preferred return. Mm. It took me three years to, for me to get any money. There was just barely enough money to pay them the 8% and nothing left. And I would squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and make it work and make it work. And now we've done we've done a refi. Rents rents have bumped up. Um, the neighborhood's completely changed around it, and we're all, including me, getting about a fifteen percent dividend. Beautiful. And and it's never going to you know unless you know a bird flu or a dirty bomb hits, it's never going to go down from that. Mm-hmm. So I want investors who don't want to flip anything. I think flipping is a that's just a shitty verb. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and, and it really forces your back up against a wall where you, you actually, in my opinion, create more risk for yourself because you're relying on a market exit as opposed yeah. to refinancing it and cash flowing it long term, as you said, like a long term annuity just in the form of, uh, of a real asset. And then my goal is to get to an infinity return. So say you give me half a million dollars. Um, I want to, as soon as possible, maybe it takes seven, maybe even eight years, I want to refinance the building, give you all of your capital back, and then we're just playing with house money. Right. And then you're at an infinity percent return. And I want investors who understand and are attracted to that. I don't want investors who hunt and, and eat by hunting every single meal. I want investors who get the concept of planting a seed yeah. and waiting and waiting and waiting and eating forever. For sure. But, but um, let me uh, ask the question again because – you know, if, if they're providing the majority of the equity to do the deal and they want yeah. out. Correct. 
so it's not liquid. So the operating agreement says that there's a threshold that I can't override where it's almost basically everyone but me. So mm-hmm. I tend to own between 15 to 30% of a project, depending on how on how it works out. But if everyone else, you know, there, there's a ratio, say it's 65%, 70%, 75% wants to sell, then that's fine, we sell. But it's a pretty high bar. Got it. And I never, I learned the lesson that you'd never have just one investor because if no one else is watching, they don't have to play nice in the sandbox. <laughs> so I, I enjoy having six or seven or eight investors and I send out, you know, my quarterly narratives and newsletter and then here's a link to the, you know, the the, the profit and loss and, and the books and then, you know, we've, you get your, your, your check wired into your account and mm-hmm. it just happens just, you know, it's boringly regular and it's, and, and once it starts happening, like I said, it never stops, and it's it's fun. And then the investors call back and say, "What else do you got?" Yeah, right. And, exactly. Let, let's do let's do the next deal. I, I saw that you yeah. actually uh, used CrowdStreet, which is mm-hmm. one of these uh, e- equity crowdfunding platforms. And so it sounds like yeah. that's kind of doing a lot of the the back end management for you, where it actually becomes a pretty standard process for the investors. Is that right? Yes and no. So CrowdStreet was really kind to me. So I did what's called a Regulation A raise with the SEC for the dumbbell. And I've only done one, and I'll probably do one other just to see if I can do it in, you know, in half the time and for half the cost. But mm. boy, it was a heavy lift. Mm. And I didn't want to be responsible for, doing the, for creating the online portal and for the investors to come in and you know, click, click, click. Just like when you go on and, and buy something from Amazon.com, I didn't want to become a, a specialist in figuring out how to create that software and create that back of house work. So CrowdStreet did that for me, but they normally they do what are called regulation D raises, which is just accredited investors, high net worth individuals, and they raise money that way. And that, that wasn't interesting to me. I have this weird desire to bridge the wealth gap in America. Mm-hmm. And one way to do that is to invite unaccredited investors to the table, which is illegal to do unless you jump through a lot of, a lot of hoops. Legally. Which is the reg A route, right? The exactly. non-accredited yeah. investor route. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they helped on that technically, but I don't think they'll ever do another regulation a hmm. platform for a developer only because they're, there's like three a year or five. A year. I mean, they're, so, they're, they're so rare hmm. that I don't see anyone tapping their shoulder for it. Cause it's a lot of work for the payoff. Yeah. I, I've looked into crowdfunding a lot and, you know, prior to getting into real estate development, I was in solar development and, you know, there was some <laughs> activity in the crowdfunding space there as well. What, in your opinion, do you feel like is the state of the, the real estate equity crowdfunding market right now? And do you, are you optimistic? Yeah. Is it really truly open now to, for the everyday investor or is it still kind of yeah. for the, uh, the accredited folk? Well, great question. So the crowdfunding is, for the most part, for everyday. The, the, the concept of it is to invite everyone to the table. But in real estate, it, uh, it's still a pretty onerous task to get across the finish line to even be able to you know, uh, uh, publish an offering and go out and solicit funds. That's, you know, that's some scary shit. And it should be, because Ms. McGillicuddy is going to be investing her you know, life savings with some charlatan who's going to rob her blind <laughs> that's gonna have that, that, that if you if you make it easier for developers or anyone to access Ms. McGillicuddy's money bad things will happen so I get that the bar should be high and it should be difficult to to do this um, with that being said I went through the SEC and multiple states to raise one and a half million dollars which was a lot of work but they have right as we speak I'm just in the next probably three weeks going to do my second crowdfunding offering um, wait, when, is, when are you going to post this? Oh, uh, it doesn't matter because... Next week. Yeah, when are you going to post this? Okay. Mm. I wonder how much I can say about it. Um, or in a couple of I weeks. Probably already, maybe I already <laughs> broke the law. Damn it. Um, <laughs> they have, regardless of what I'm going to do, what I'm more interested in is what are called uh, OIOs uh, or, or, or interstate offerings. So you in California, there's a mechanism for you to do an offering just with California residents where um, at the, through the, the regulation, A, I could have raised as much as $50 million. I didn't need that. I, I'll never need that. Um, an interest rate offering has a lower bar. In, in Oregon, I think it's $250,000. I think in California, it, it might be $5 million. But each state has a different threshold. It's a lot easier to jump through the hoops 
And then, you know, I, the, the product that I'm wanting to crowdfund here is a, is a for-profit, no subsidy, homelessness housing project. It's a mixed-use building, and one of the six units is an 11-bed single residence occupancy, basically a flop house, yeah. deeply, deeply affordable um, housing What's that option. One That's Jolene's first cousin. Got it. I don't think it's on my website. Okay. I think for legal reasons, it's not on until I can leak, until I, you know, get all the blessings and, and I can go out there and do the offering. Got it. Um, so that's the intent. Um, uh, <laughs> but before, before I hang up, I'm going to, so do you edit this at all, by the way? We can edit it if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I might, I, I'm going to find out from someone in my office uh, if, if I need to, I love, I, I love not editing anything. I love being transparent as all get out. And, yeah. uh, but um, but I but we'll see. Before we before I hang up, I want to ask her if I'm going to need sure. you to edit any of this out. Yeah, no, if if, if if this is if I if I don't have to edit it out and your listeners get to hear this kind of um, <laughs> the whole thing unedited, that's pretty awesome. So well, and what's uh, really, what's really cool is that I mean, you kind of you do kind of live an unedited life, but you know there are certain <laughs> things that you have to you know, moderate for the audiences that, you know, you're, you're facing, you're still a developer at the end of the day and you still have yeah. interest of your own and of your investors that need to yeah. be protected. So, well, if I do something that, that keeps me from doing it again, then I'm an idiot. Then shame on me because yeah. at the end of the day, on my deathbed, I'm not going to wish I had more money or a bigger yacht. I'm going to wish I, you know, uh, there, there will still be drawings and drawings and drawings of unbuilt projects. So, mm-hmm. Um, I just don't want to make any mistakes, which make it harder for me to do the next project. I want to do 20 little micro homelessness housing projects and have them pepper the entire city because that's how traditionally um, the the abject poor have been dealt with. Not, not you know, 3,000 people living in a tent city out by the airport, but instead, uh, you know, the entire population takes on little bits and pieces of, of, of everybody, of everybody's needs. And that's so, how Northern Europe does it. That's how all the success stories do it that way. Yeah. So why the hell can't we? So let, let's get into that a little more. So you, you really, you have a, a pretty sincere aspiration to help the homeless problem of, of Portland. Like, are you, sure. uh, you're positioning yourself as kind of someone to reinvent homelessness or, or how homelessness can be solved through real estate projects? Well, that sounds too grand, but, yeah, so I, I, as much as my smooth brain will allow, I have been trying to figure out how to do some deep housing affordability. And in a perfect world, I do it without subsidy, not because I, only because I'm, I, I don't have the patience to be at a table with 18 people and do pri- public private sector work. And um, I am a small, nimble developer, mm-hmm. and I, want to do a lot of slap singles to right field, get on base and then just get up to bat again. So, um, so uh, I figured out at least on this first project that it can make money. It's not, it's not amazing money. It's not zipper like money, Mm -hmm. but it's neat to be able to do it. And it's subsidized internally um, through two mechanisms. A it's subsidized because it's not, it's, it's one of, six units in a mixed use project mm-hmm. and the other five units I want to get as much in as possible. Mm-hmm. So that's a way to kind of internally subsidize a project in the mm-hmm. performa. A B, I want my investors to know that you know this isn't the product we're getting rich on. This is the product we're changing the city on. So mm-hmm. if you want to jump on board this transformational project, which is this tiny little I mean it's a it's if you drove by it on your tour you wouldn't it wouldn't be remarkable in any way, shape or form to you. Was this the, the one neighborhood that- was this the one next to your office? No, that's 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 a ex- housing experiment, which is housing for social workers. But it's it's not dissimilar from that. But the one next to my office will be a big, bold building that I'm proud of. This other one is going to be just fit into a little pocket um, lot in a neighborhood that has to be the best neighbor ever, um, and I, so I can do it over and over again. So there's no deep nimbyism that derails it because I want I, I desperately need for the first one to be a you know, arousing success. So there can be a second, third and a, you know, 15th and 16th down the road. For sure. Like, kind of like a pilot project. <laughs> That's exciting. So um, one of your success or one of your recipes for, for success, in my opinion, is that you've partnered with a lot of uh, local operators. And I, and I love how you actually 
highlight them on your website too. Like, you know, the, yeah. pe the people that are actually making the spaces and the boxes that you're creating into a live happening, you know, events. Yeah. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about how, how you've approached finding other people to work with uh, as, you know, them as operators and you as their kind of developer. Yeah, no, that's, that's the fun part. So I maintain that I'm, I'm pretty good at, at making good buildings. I, I've got that skill down. I can make good buildings. I, I don't make great buildings. Um, from a design standpoint, the zipper's probably, you know, a little bit better than good. And the fair-haired dumbbell would, is trying to attain greatness, but it, on its own, it's not great. And everything else is, you know, really good, proud of it all. Mm -hmm. But if I ever get a great building, if new new crusher court or the two thirds project or you know, the tree farms they're if they're viewed as great buildings it's, it's because the tenants turn good buildings into great buildings and i and i'm not just being humble with that that's just a fact it's mm -hmm. it's it's about the the human scale the human capital um the social capital that's interwoven into a building so i i definitely eschew franchises i definitely uh, don't want a starbucks uh, in in any of my buildings uh, and I'm at this point now, I don't know how to start. So it's tough to give advice to any budding developers, but now that I have, you know, right now I have 42 commercial tenants and I've got another six products on the, on the boards with another probably, I don't know, 50 commercial tenants that'll fill those buildings up. I've probably identified half of those 50, mostly because of the 42, so I will go to, in my new New Crusher Corp project where my office is, I need a lot of creative offices in the dumbbell, creative office tenants. So I'll go to Half Court Studios or Studio Mega or the Beauty Shop or these kind of cool creative agencies. They're way cooler than me, by the way. I mean, I, <laughs> they're super. They're like the, you're, they're pretty, the you're pretty cool, Kevin, uh, I have well, to say. <laughs> well, that's nice. But, I, but if you, that's awfully nice. But if we walked into the other spaces, you would realize that I don't know who the next generation is. I don't know who this, you know, on the office side, who the new Studio Mega is or the new Half Court Studio. Right. But your your finger is not necessarily on the pulse. You have to rely on, on the other people that are kind of part of that creative class, right? Correct. So I go to them and I say, hey, you get a month of free rent if you just you know, if your introduction to to the to the younger version of you or the new version of you or the parallel version of you ends up in a signed lease you know you get a you know three month of rent at least and if it's like a big lease big space you know two months whatever it takes whatever makes you happy but mm -hmm. but you're really happy here in the new crusher court or you're happy as a restaurant tour in the zipper i don't know who the new sous chef in, in town is but you likely do and i'm happy to could you a big fat check just for an introduction if the introduction turns out to be something compelling game on and that's the best way to fill my buildings i've found yeah. um i've the dumbbell is the first building i gave to a, a commercial broker who put their big sign on the in the window and on the top of the corners of the building with their you know phone number that you can read from across the river and their name on it and they've had that up there for eight months <laughs> And I don't have one tenant from them on the dumbbell. And oh, I feel wow. bad for them because, you know, <laughs> that's like a suit talking to other suits. Yeah, the two corporate. Yeah, and that's just not who I'm going to get, and that's not who's drawn to the building. So I hired the beauty shop, which is an ad agency, two doors down from my office here, and they're tenants of mine. And I'm like, can you just create a website and just brand the shit out of that building and turn it into something that's like people are buzzing about? Mm -hmm. Most folks thought it was an apartment building. Mm-hmm. People just didn't know what it was because it looks so weird. So I have, I was, I'm talking to you now. I've got seven tenants, and they're about six weeks into their campaign. And they all came through them. And the funny thing is there's a budget for over $300,000 to give to a, a broker to lease it. Right now, I think I've spent $7,000. Oh, wow. To, to fill up a third of it. That's so, got to be that's got to be that's got to be pretty compelling. But you can't buy social capital. I mean, you've kind yeah, of you've sure. kind of found a way to source that kind of emergent creativity and and the cool people that are doing cool things. H has you know what was the initial attempt to get the initial people right? Because you had to kind of you know you moved to Portland a while ago. Yeah. You've probably been kind of in the, in that in that world for quite some time to establish good friends, but. How yeah. uh, how did you kind of originally start 
going about finding the people that would give you that kind of hyper network of yeah. creatives. Yeah. So restaurants are the first place to, to go. So when, whenever you pioneer a neighborhood and I, I can't afford the neighborhoods that are already, like, I can't, can't go to Rock Ridge and buy land. <laughs> That's, I, I just can't swim with the big boys. Um, and by boys, I literally mean 65 year old fat white boys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wearing or their wives. Or their wives. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's just, no, it's such a, it's God, it, when I meet a, a, a female developer, I'm so happy. Yeah. And I want like, Me for too. example, I've got three women that work here at Gorilla and I say them all the time. You like, you just morally, you need to quit. You need to suck everything you can out of this company, be a sponge <laughs> and then quit and start your own development firm. That's because awesome. You need to desperately. The, the the world needs you to. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, the the creativity that that females can bring into the development process. Yeah, you know, it, it it boggles my mind that there's not more women who have stepped into that role and really taken charge of it and and pioneer the way. Well, I don't even know about that. I just know that it's 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 it's, it's fucked up. Frankly, that it's such a boys' club, and and I it's it's not healthy. So it just has to be, be, it just has to be shifted and fixed. And I can't, I, I hope it happens. So I, I, I feel a little evangelical when I talk to my crew and, and I hope they all, all hang their shingle eventually and, and become their own developers. Cool. Um, but I can't, I can't go into Rockridge. I can't. Um, which, which is it, those. which for those who listen to the podcast, you know, from around the country and, uh, I think my my I hope my I hope my following will, will become uh, more than just the uh, the locals in Oakland, but it, it's one of the higher end neighborhoods in the in the city here that Kevin's referring to. Yes, so I have to be, and and frankly, I forget your original question because I'm talking about where I go and how I go about it. Okay, you you, um, were, you were talking about going to restaurants to find uh, right. those initial kind of cool folk around. Yep. So when neighborhoods change, there's a certain pattern to how they change. And this is a whole other podcast. And I know that, you know, the hours almost coming never up. coming and going. But this is a, con- a conversation about gentrification, mm. which is right now, like, the biggest thing I'm trying to tackle right now. It's uh, well, a hot button. It's, it's a hot button issue. I am a gentrifier. I now have come to that conclusion. And, and, and there are good and bad things that are uh, nested in that phrase. And I want to keep the good things, but how can I fix the bad things? So I'm working on my first reverse gentrification project now, and that's a whole other topic. But we got to figure that shit out. Yeah, and, and as um, best as you can, if you can capture, because this is really important. Because <laughs> you know, and, and I think you've you've probably internalized it a lot more than most. So good and bad aspects of gentrification, a, a general trajectory of how it how what happens right and we're kind of talking yeah. it seems like at the very first point of cool restaurants starting to pop up yeah so i go into neighborhoods that are undiscovered or, or you know on the fringe or kind of I'm, i don't mind I, I enjoy pioneering neighborhoods and there's a pattern to how neighborhoods transition and oakland has seen this in a huge way mm-hmm. of course but every city in america has seen it in a huge way and you know restaurants are oftentimes the early adopters so I can find rest. It was easiest for me before I had a reputation to find restaurant tenants and, uh, and to, to, to roll the dice with them, believe in them and get them into my buildings. And, uh, then it becomes a there, there, that becomes a destination of some kind, mm-hmm. whether it's a little taco taqueria that moved out of a cart, but that happens to make award winning tacos and there's a line out the door. Okay. You know, I don't need, high, high, high rent out of you. I, I'll get high rent out of everyone else, but the line at the door is going to, you know, make everyone take notice. Mm-hmm. So that anyone can do that. Just go find the line that exists right now. Go find a place that is busting at the seams that doesn't, that you know they're going to move into a bigger space or a better space or a more compelling space and go literally talk to the owner. It's, it's just old school, you know, gumshoe reporting it's yeah, just right. <laughs> to literally getting a, to walking out with a set of plans, you know, who's the owner? Oh, well, it's Waldo Bibiano. Okay, cool. Is he here? No. And then you go back. Is this Waldo here? No. Is this Waldo here? No. Fourth time. Oh yeah. He's in the back. He's a guy, you know, you know, the shuck in the corn. Mm-hmm. Hey, Oswaldo. Yeah. I, I can't talk to you. That's fine. You keep shucking. I'm going to hold drawings up in front of you while I talk. <laughs> and then at the end we were like shaking hands and he's like, cool. Yeah. Let's, you know, let's do this. So, that's that's all there is to it, and then and then Oswaldo goes in, and then you get a, a half a dozen other restaurants the same way, and then and then you get a reputation, and then 
it just rolls from there. Yeah. So then you talk to Oswaldo and say, Hey, do you, have, do you know the next sous chef who needs something? I'll give you some free rent. You know, so it just kind of builds on itself. But the tricky thing is getting back to gentrification, yeah. which again, there's no way we're just touching the tip of the iceberg here yeah. before this, this podcast is up. How do I do that without displacing anybody? Right. How do I specifically, um, uh, in the neighborhoods of color, if I go in and, I'm, so now, if I'm buying a piece of property and there's an African American owner that's selling, I am not interested in just buying that property, cutting a big fat check to this person, and that person moves away. Um, that's a, that's a fine answer. That's a way that for an individual or a family to experience um, a life changing event. That's great. Mm-hmm. But I'm much more interested if you hang on and I give you maybe a pay half of the sales price in cash and the other half you keep in as equity and long-term ownership in the property. So mm-hmm. you are not just a renter or a displaced person, but you maintain ownership in this neighbor that's changing around you mm-hmm. and you get to ride the wave of appreciation and, um, an improvement. And that's a, there's a nice monetary, uh, uh, uptick yeah. that, that you enjoy. So I'm just not asking you to go away. So that's a, that's one part to help to kind of, um, not reverse gentrify, but but kind of change the the ebb and tide of gentrification. Another way is to specifically find tenants. If I'm going to internally subsidize a project for homelessness, for example, well, I can use the same math to internally subsidize a project. Um, I can't choose you based on race or any of the other protected classes. That's illegal. I can't mm-hmm. say here I'll give you cheaper rent if if you're Mexican American. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can say. If you can show me that 50 years ago um, you had familial ties to this neighborhood, to the zip code, whether it be with phone records or anything, mm-hmm. then I will rent you a commercial space for a buck a square foot. Hmm. And I'll internally subsidize that by getting really high rent from everyone else around you, but I will keep you as a member of the, of the neighborhood and community in at locked in lower rates. So you can enjoy this process too. So it can happen as a renter. It can happen as an owner with equity. It can happen um, residentially. It could happen commercially. So that's what I'm working on now. It requires investors who are okay making instead of a 23% return, you know, an 18% return right. or a 16% return. And, you know, if I tell this story, my impression is that there are a lot of people who would happily make you know, a 16% return. And it's not a big piece of their net worth. Mm-hmm. You know, if they cut me a hundred grand and they're worth, you know, 10 million or 20 million, it's a rounding error. It's, it's karma money. It's a karma investment. Yeah. And by the way, I'm pro- I'm probably beating most of the other investments in their portfolio at 16% and it's still karma money. So. Well, and, and I, so I, I think that's a great strategy to take where you're trying to look for ways to kind of connect people to the place that they come from. And I think, I guess that's kind of the general sentiment is that, you know, displacement is essentially people having to move away when they don't want to move away. So to, to find, to find, to find ideas and, and creative deal structuring to uh, encourage for that longevity to persist, you know, and, and the, and the true spirit of, or I guess the, the more recent spirit of the neighborhood you know, and, yeah. and carry it through to the next generation. I, I think, yeah, that is the goal that I think more people need to kind of put their minds to what you've clearly been putting your mind to figuring out yeah. ways to actually address this and still not, and still make money doing it. But well, it's, it's commercial friggin' real estate. Yeah. I mean, it, all you have to do is not sell and you're going to get rich and <laughs> it's not, you're not going to get rich tomorrow or in a year or five years, but it's just what happens. Yeah. So if you can invite people to the table that, that have been excluded from the table, if you could be really thoughtful about every piece of the process from the investors, to, you know, to the, to the equity, to the, um, to, to, to crowdfunding, to the tenant mix, to the, to the actual design, just be thoughtful about everything. It's not hard. Right. Just care. Yeah, <laughs> All exactly. you have to do is care. And at the end of the day, I mean, that's a perfect way to kind of wrap up our conversation here because you're, you're calling for more conscious developers, people who just are more thoughtful and aware of all of the compl- And it's a complex business. There's no doubt about that. There's, there's so many different systems at play and so many different forces that have to be all synthesized and come up with an idea that's still successful 
across yeah. the board. So yeah. it's not an easy task, but I, I think the reward is great because you really do get to see your creation being manifested in the world and actually seeing progress uh, made in, in these sorts of neighborhoods that, you know, yeah. are in the process of changing. So I completely agree. And, I, and you said that really eloquently. And I, and I say it a little differently, which tends to be, and I talk to my crew about it all the time and talk to anyone I, who will give me an ear all the time. All I try to do is to not be a dick. It's <laughs> literally a four, it's a forward motto of guerrilla development. Don't be a dick. Tell me you have a bumper and, sticker for that. Uh, um, Brett Schultz, who, who shares the episode with me, has a little placard by his computer. Don't be a dick. If every one of us did that. So it's not like I'm striving to care and be thoughtful and be all, and just do work extra hard. If all I did was not be a dick, I'm going to make cool buildings. <laughs> I love it. So I, I, do you want to leave the, the final thought for anybody else? Uh, you know, and again, with the, the thinking in mind is that you have a, a lot of potential developers and aspiring developers uh, listening to your thoughts here. So what would you leave them with in terms of uh, going after and you know, pursuing projects that really can move the needle forward? Oh, wow. Uh, geez. That's a, that's a big lift to ask me now. So two things. Uh, um, it all depends on your risk appetite. I realize now that I have a risk appetite that's off, that's off the charts. So, <laughs> Um, you know, my wife is a cash and carry woman. She, she has one credit card and she just, she hates debt. So she, you know, any, if she looks too closely at any of my products, she, her heart starts to flutter and, and she almost passes out. <laughs> so if you're wired for it, then you, you are almost, a, you know, you're obliged morally to do it and do it right. A. B. I invite anyone to look at my website because I post all of my projects open source. So not only can you look at the plans and you can download the plans and um, and the photos of the images in the buildings, but you can download the Excel spreadsheets of the pro forma, not just a PDF, but you can get into it, do a save as. And I, I got a, an email from someone in Perth, Australia. I said, hey, I just built the zipper here in Perth. I just copied everything you did because, you know, you put it on your website. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. And I said, no, it's fine. I've been to Perth once. I doubt I'll ever go again. It was a cool city and I'm happy that the zipper's there instead of, you know, something worse. So. And I love, I, I love that because, you know, there is a level of opaqueness historically in, in real estate development that has yeah. kind of reinforced the barriers to entry. So the yeah. fact that you're kind of coming out and being hyper transparent with folks, and I'm trying to do that as well with a whole developer academy that I've just put together. Uh, cool. So that more people can understand all of the different elements that that's involved in in getting started and and figuring out how they can contribute to their cities as well. Well, good job. That's, so, that's awesome. Thank you so much again, Kevin. I, I really appreciated the conversation. We touched on uh, a lot of stuff. So um, uh, I definitely point people again to your uh, website, GorillaDev.co. And uh, check out what you're doing there. And uh, I look forward to uh, staying connected in the future. Thanks, Chris. Good chatting with you. Great. Yeah, you too. All right. See you. Thanks. If you enjoyed the show, the best way you can support the developer spotlight is by leaving us a rating and a review on iTunes. That's the best way to help new and emerging real estate developers discover the show. And finally, if you're a new or aspiring real estate developer, Go check out the Smart Growth Developer Academy over at smartgrowth.co. That's smartgrowth.co.